sticking to time, <laughs> uh, 15 minutes uh, a piece, and I'll be moderating this session. Uh, I am Liz Skilton. I'm at the University of Louisiana Lafayette, and I'm going to be serving as the chair today. Uh, rather than read each of the individual presenters' info um, all together, I'm going to do it before each paper so that it's a little bit easier to keep track of on Zoom. Uh, so I was kind of looking up what the, the popular things to do on Zoom for conferences is, and this is like one of those things that comes up. Uh, so our first presenter today is uh, Petra Munro uh, Hendry. Uh, so, uh, and she'll be presenting uh, Sisters on the Frontier, Catholic Women Educators and the Shaping of the Early American Republic in the Gulf Coast Southwest. Uh, Hendry is the St. Bernard Chapter of the LSU Alumni Association Endowed Professor at Louisiana State University Emeritus in the College of Human Sciences and Education, where she teaches courses in the history of curriculum, curriculum theory, and narrative research. Her current research interests focus on the production of the educated citizen in French colonial Louisiana and the early national period, particularly the impact of the Haitian Revolution on American education. Situating educational history within a transatlantic framework, she challenges the Anglo-Protestant common school movement as the singular source of democratic education. She is currently completing her book, Reimagining uh, the Educated Citizen, Creole Pedagogies in the Atlantic World, 1685 to 1896. Uh, and she's received funding from a variety of different sources, um, most recently from uh, a Regents Award to Louisiana Artists and Scholars and the Woest Fellow uh, in Arts and Humanities from the Historic New Orleans Collection. Uh, please welcome Petra Munro Hentry. Thank yeah. you. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, let me see if I can get situated. This is my first time doing a conference online, so let's hope uh, I can get <coughs> situated. Did it share the PowerPoint? Uh, I'm only seeing the top half of it. Um, and I'm not seeing it at all, sorry. <laughs> There we go. We're starting to see a little bit more. Maybe drag it up on your screen. Let's see if that helps a little bit. Yep, there it is. Okay, let me get it in. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Does that work? Yes, that works. Go ahead. Okay. Um, All right. Well, uh, again, the title is Sisters on the Frontier, and I've added French Catholic women educators and the shaping of the early American Republic in the Gulf Coast Southwest. Gentlemen here, here say, gentlemen here say that Galveston is a new place since the Ursulines came. Heat and every other inconvenience is of no account. Excuse me. <clears throat> when there is question of gaining souls to Christ, and never was there a finer or more teachable race of children than in this comparatively wild land. <clears throat> Sister Mary Joseph, 1852. <clears throat> Arriving in Galveston, Texas in July of 1852, Sister Mary Patrick Joseph, an Ursuline nun from Ireland, captures the apostolic missionary fervor among French women religious. She was part of a major women's movement in which female French religious <clears throat> saw themselves as activists in a world initiative to reinvigorate the Catholic Church through the medium of education. Between 1817 and 1865, nine orders of French women religious <clears throat> established mis mission schools in the territories west of the Mississippi. French women religious left the comfort of their convents in France, Canada, Ireland, and various cities in the early American Republic to settle in the frontier regions west of the Mississippi with the goal of forging an aggressive program of universal Catholic education. They established hundreds of schools throughout the Gulf Southwest that provided education to Mexican Americans, African Americans, European immigrants, indigenous peoples, and American settlers. While historians have described the global missionary revival in the 19th century, the impact of teaching missions of French women religious in the Gulf Coast Southwest has remained at the margins of educational history. Telling the story of French women missionary educators in the United States <clears throat> requires a reconsideration of national narratives that have privileged the Northern Anglo-Protestant common school movement as the exclusive site for public education. 
This paper maintains that French women religious, and for the purposes of this paper, I'll just have time to focus on the Ursulines, the first group there. <clears throat> what I maintain is that French women religious also forged a vision of public education. However, unlike the common school movement, whose goal was the production of the individual citizen of the nation state, French women religious embraced a transnational citizen whose common, <coughs> excuse me, common humanity was forged through spiritual universalism. The Ursuline sisters, members of the oldest teaching order of nuns in the Catholic Church, have, had been at the forefront of the first global missionary activity as part of the Counter-Reformation. Established in Quebec in 1639, New Orleans in 1727, and Martinique in 1729, they were part of the first worldwide Catholic apostolic mission. In the aftermath of the French Revolution and Bourbon Restoration, a second missionary fervor included the Ursuline nuns, primarily from France and Germany, who settled in other parts of North America, including Boston, Ohio, New York City, and Louisville, Kentucky. <clears throat> the Ursulines moved not only northwest, but also nor uh, westward along the Gulf Coast, where Archbishop Blanc of New Orleans extended his efforts to expand the Catholic Church into the newly independent Republic of Texas. Since the Mexican War of Independence in 1821, the Catholic Church <clears throat> in Mexico had suffered almost to the point of extinction. Archbishop Blanc sent Father Jean-Marie Audin to make a survey of the situation. Bishop Odin approached the Ursulines to request that they establish a mission school in Galveston. <clears throat> the Ursuline Council deliberations of March 1846, led by Mother Superior Seraphim, suggest that the Ursulines were originally not in favor of founding a new convent, given the fear of contracting new debts. However, <clears throat> when Bishop Odin promised three new French excuse me, <clears throat> would be novices for Galveston, the Reverend Mother capitulated. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> the community <clears throat> elect elected Sister Blount, who had dedicated 29 years of her life to the New Orleans community to head the new mission. <clears throat> excuse me. And Sister Truchin, who had arrived in New Orleans from France in 1836 as her assistant. In January of 1847, they, along with four other choir nuns, making a total of five French and one Irish, as well as two Converse nuns, one American and one French, <clears throat> donned the black veils of cloistered nuns, leaving on the two-day voyage aboard the steamship Palmetto to Galveston. And not only did the Ursulines observe strict cloister, but in relocating both choir, who were full-fledged nuns who would be in charge of the school, and converse nuns who were basically servants, <clears throat> the Ursulines retained their strict social hierarchy. Shortly after arriving in Galveston, <clears throat> they received their first students. Sister Stanislaw wrote to Bishop Blanc in New Orleans in July of 1847, the number of our pupils increases each day. At this time, we have 55 boarders, day scholars, and half boarders, not counting those of the poor school. As to the borders, we have been obliged to refuse, refuse many because of lack of space. Like the Ursulines in New Orleans, they continued the French custom of organizing the school along three tiers. Fee-paying boarding students received an academic education, day scholars received a rudimentary education, and poor students, enslaved persons, free people of color, as well as former Mexicans attended catechism classes that were held in the afternoons and on Sundays. While class clearly shaped a hierarchy of social relations, Ursuline education was extended to all girls and women, regardless of race or ethnicity. Sister Stanislaw wrote that they had opened an adult class for religious instruction, and the first person to attend to be instructed was, quote, a negress, 43 years old, born in New Orleans. I noticed that she has a great desire for instruction. Her present masters, although Protestant, permit her to come here twice a week. While the Ursulines never directly challenged the Catholic Church's accommodation and participation in slavery, they did pursue an inclusive educational philosophy. <clears throat> However, this was not without severe challenges. 
Only two of the eight sisters could speak English, which greatly limited the ability to teach and conduct school. Bishop Audin traveled to the Ursuline community in Quebec in August of 1849 to persuade them to release two of their highly educated English-speaking sisters to come to Galveston to teach. <clears throat> By November, sisters Chantel and Thomas, both seasoned and very intelligent teachers, were released from the Quebec convent to join the convent in Galveston. Unlike the common schools of the Northeast, which relied predominantly on local male teachers, the convent in Galveston was a multilingual transnational institution with an international fa faculty whose pedagogy was inclusive. This vision was in many ways in direct contrast to the role of public schools in the common school movement that focused on building American citizens, of course, who were white and male. By the 1880s, the Ursuline Convent School in Galveston had grown with students from all parts of Texas and Mexico, resulting in demand for their educational skills in other cities, including San Antonio. So Bishop Odin reached out again to the Ursulines in New Orleans in the summer of 1851 to recruit sisters for a second Catholic school in San Antonio. On August 28th, the records of the deliberations of the Ursuline Council note that Sister Truar was elected as the Mother Superior to the new San Antonio Foundation, along with Sister St. Monaghan as her assistant and two converse or lay sisters. Dressed as seculars now, given the increasing anti-Catholic sentiment of the nation, the four Ursulines left New Orleans on September 7th with stores of furniture and books for the new convent school. After a short stay in Galveston, they were joined by three choir nuns, two French and one American from Galveston. <clears throat> Despite not being able to speak Spanish and living in rubble for months, the sisters recorded that they opened the school on November 3rd. Oops, sorry. Early in the morning, parents began to arrive with their children, Americans, French, Germans, Mexicans. La Mer received the payment from each, and between the melange of languages and names, she thought she would lose her intellect. The mother assistant <coughs> sat in the class and examined each child as she presented herself, then classed them according to their language and ability, and thus passed the first day. This multilingual student body, French, Spanish, German, and English, posed serious pedagogical challenges for the majority of sisters who spoke neither Spanish nor English. Bishop Odin, who was well aware of the need for English-speaking teachers, ret returned from a recruitment trip to Europe the following year with sisters Mary Patrick Joseph and Mary Augustine Joseph, who came from the Ursuline Convent of St. Mary's, Waterford, Ireland. The convent school in San, San, San Antonio was now composed of seven choir nuns, four French, one American, two Irish, and two French converse nuns. Sister Joseph, who taught English at the school, wrote to her mother superior, Magdalene, in Ireland. You wish to have details on our dear children. At present, we have six boarders from want of room. One of those is a Protestant, or rather, a Nothingarian. In the other school, we have about 50 children, half the number Mexicans, who are of dark complexion, but not black. All the children born in Texas of European parents are fair. Besides the Mexicans, we have English, German, and French children, almost anxious to learn English. <clears throat> in fact, they must know it, for it is the language of the states, and they feel ashamed at not being able to speak it. The Americans who know English learn Spanish, German, and French, so the schools are miniature babbles. Like all Ursuline schools, the sisters continued the caste-like tradition of three tiers of education based on class. These schools were, however, for all practical purposes, integrated, unlike the Anglo-Protestant common schools, which were segregated. While the school was teaching French and English, they lacked a Spanish and German teacher. The following year, Mother Joseph wrote to Mother Superior in Ireland, La Mer begs of you to pray that Rudicinda Garza, who so kindly teaches us Spanish, may enter our novitiate. She wishes to be a religious, but not but does not like being so near her family. Besides her personal and mental qualities, which render her a very desirable subject, her entrance here would give great stability to the house, as her family are the most influential of the Mexicans. 
Rugacinda came from a long line of original settlers who came to San Antonio in 1715 from the Canary Islands. She was extraordinarily well educated and fluent in French, Spanish, English, Latin, and German, as well as talented in mathematics, drawing, painting, and needlework. And trained in novitiate, she was the first native San Antonio postulate <clears throat> received into the community, as well as the first Mexican. Unlike the Ursulines of New Orleans, whose missionary focus had been on the conversion of enslaved Africans, the missions in Texas focused their energies on reestablishing and strengthening the Catholic faith among former Spanish Catholics. Sister Joseph wrote, while the Mexicans need instruction much, they are naturally pious and celebrate many feasts of devotion, but they are ignorant of the principal feasts of the year, for example, the Ascension and Pentecost. They keep Our Lady of Guadalupe, December 12th, 12th with the firing of a cannon, dancing, singing. The devotion of Spanish locals to honoring the festival of, of Our Lady of Guadalupe reflect, reflects the processes of creolization within the Catholic Church. This feast day on December 12th can be traced to an Aztec le legend. The trans-religion significance of this feast day was not lost on the Ursuline sisters who understood the importance importance of honoring this figure whose symbolism not only spoke to their veneration of Mary as the first teacher of Jesus, but whose image also incorporated meanings of Aztec and indigenous belief systems. The strength of their mission was in adapting their teaching to take account of the multilingual nature of their students, but also to incorporating local native interpretations of Catholicism. In contrast, again, to common schools, which sought to Americanize the transnational worldview of the Ursulines, allowed for hybridity and creolization. Rudicinda Garza eventually became Mother Superior in the 1880s, and under her leadership, the number of sisters grew to 35, and <clears throat> the academy had accommodations for 70 to 80 boarders, many of whom came from all parts of Western Texas and Mexico. The Ursulines eventually opened a total of seven schools in Texas, the last one in 1930 in Pecos, establishing a 200-year-old history of female Catholic education in the Gulf Coast Southwest. With the growth of secular schools by the 1890s, the Ursulines would eventually have to abandon cloister, discontinue French as their official language, <clears throat> and comply with Jim Crow laws that demanded separate institutions for Blacks and whites, as well as in Texas, Mexican Americans and Native Americans. However, for a significant period of the 19th century, French women religious had been central to financing, establishing, and administering hundreds of schools for children of all races, well before state-supported public education was available in the Gulf Coast Southwest. Their stories reveal a more complex history of American education, one which suggests multiple competing visions of what constitutes public education. For the Ursulines, the public was grounded in the universal, not the nation. Their schools <coughs> sought to embody a common humanity, or at least they attempted to <laughs> embody a common humanity that was multicultural, multilingual, and most importantly, transnational. This educational narrative has long been neglected given the privileging of the Anglo-Protestant common school movement as the origin of public education, weaving the stories of these marginalized educators into the fabric of American history is long overdue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was a really compelling presentation, uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion, which um, will be led by Mark Fernandez a little bit later on. Um, so we've heard about the educators. We are going to move on to the prostitutes in this section. Uh, next up, we have uh, Lindsay Silver, uh, who's going to be presenting a paper called um, Miss Kate, Joe Ray, and the Mexican Tigress, and Race, Violence, and Social Power in Postbellum New Orleans Prostitution. Uh, Lindsay Silver is a PhD candidate in history at Louisiana State University with an anticipated graduation date of this December. Is that right, Lindsay? Yes. So exciting. Yeah. Uh, her dissertation, The Life and Death of Kate Townsend, uh, Gender and Power in New Orleans Prostitution, 1858 to 1883, is the inspiration for her talk today. 
Uh, she has received the T. Harry Williams Fellowship at LSU and the Louisiana Chapter of the Colonial Dames of America Scholarship for her excellent work on women's and gender history, the history of the American South, and 19th century America and violence in American history. Um, please welcome Lindsay Silver. Thank you. <sighs> okay. Kate Townsend, Josephine, or Joe Ray, and Josephine Taylor were women engaged in the business of prostitution in postbellum New Orleans, yet their differences could not have been more different. Townsend was a white and wealthy madam, Ray was a moderately successful mulatto madam, and Taylor was a poor black prostitute. Despite the fact that these women un undoubtedly lived dissimilar lives, one particular aspect that they had in common was their use of violence against others. Violence was an everyday occurrence for the working class in 19th century urban America. New Orleans was no exception. Prostitution-related violence contributed to the crime statistics in cities all across the country, yet scholars seem hesitant to take this violence committed by women seriously. By comparing Townsend, Ray, and Taylor, this paper argues that all three of these women used violence as an attempt to wield, powers and, wield power and influence over others. However, their success, as well as their ability to escape punishment, hinged on their racial and economic status. A high-class white madam like Kate Townsend got away with her violent acts, mostly because she frequently targeted people who were less powerful than herself. It also helped that she was on friendly terms with the police. A mulatto madam, such as Joe Ray, mostly got away with her violent demonstrations of power because she had some degree of economic power. Her relationship with the police was not the same as Townsend's. However, the fact that she too prefer preferred her victims to have less power than herself allowed her to get away with many criminal acts of violence. Josephine Taylor, however, as a black prostitute devoid of social and economic power, got away with little to nothing. Not only did Taylor most frequently inflict violence upon others who were more powerful than herself, namely the police, but these violent episodes reflect acts of retaliation for asserting their power over her through arrest and subsequent incarcer incarceration. Kate Townsend was one of the wealthiest madams in postbellum New Orleans. She was born in Ireland around 1840. Upon her arrival in New Orleans in 1858, she immediately became a prostitute, working in some of the fanciest brothels in town before becoming a madam herself. During the 1870s and early 1880s, Townsend's brothel at 40 Basin Street was the pinnacle of luxury and refinement. Her celebrity and wealth were practically unrivaled in the Crescent City until she was brutally killed by her lover in 1883. Townsend's proclivity for violence has largely escaped the historical record because she hardly ever faced criminal prosecution for her violent misdeeds. Despite the fact that her longtime lover, Twaville Sykes, ended her life in horrific fashion, she was the one who typically wielded violence against him in order to assert her dominance over him in their relationship. Sykes never pressed charges against her because her wealth allowed him to live a life of leisure. Townsend also used violence against women who work for her, such as domestic servants and prostitutes. In fact, it appears that only twice she faced charges in the respective criminal courts. Once was for a robbery, the other involved insult and abuse, but not actual violence against a police sanitation officer, and neither resulted in any significant punishment. Overall, Kate Townsend spent very little time behind bars because her arrests were infrequent. When police did bring her into custody, she had adequate resources to secure a quick release on bond. In October 1872, Clara Willis, a prostitute working for Townsend from Cincinnati, charged her with highway robbery. According to the Daily Picayune, Willis and, the, and another prostitute left Townsend's brothel in the middle of the night to find more hospitable quarters, but still owed her for clothing and other goods. The next day, Townsend and two of her servants went out looking for the missing woman and found them at a confectionery store several blocks away drinking soda water. Townsend then proceeded to pounce on Willis like a duck upon a June bug. Townsend stole a gold chain and, and a gold watch and chain from Willis that was violently taken from her neck, almost choking her in the struggle. According to Willis's affidavit, without any notice, they attacked me, pulling my hair, tearing my dress, and clutching and violently pulling at a chain I was wearing on my neck. Willis claimed that she had to release the chain to prevent from being choked to death. 
When Townsend appeared in the recorder's court, or police court, to face the initial charges, she claimed the two women owed her money and the only way to reimburse herself for the debt was to take the action that she did. The judge did not agree with the method Townsend implied, employed to collect her debts and set her bond at $100, which she promptly paid. And he sent the case to the first district court. When the case came up that December, Willis failed to prosecute Townsend and the court dropped the charges. Kate Townsend's choice to take matters into her own hands to resolve the debt owed by Clara Willis demonstrates an intentional act of violence in order to assert power over the young prostitute. In doing so, Townsend applied equal, for equal measures of force and intimidation with the assumption that she would get away with pursuing her own style of justice because she was more powerful economically, socially, and physically than her victim. Despite the fact that her calculations were slightly amiss and allowed Townsend to to, I'm sorry. Despite the fact that her calculations were slightly amiss and that Willis did indeed press charges, Willis did not follow through with the criminal suit and allowed Townsend to escape punishment. Either Willis had already left town, Townsend, Townsend intimidated her enough to drop the charges, or both. Overall, with her principal victims consisting of her lover Sykes and the people who worked for her, Townsend consistently was able to avoid prosecution for her criminal acts of violence because she was more powerful than they were. Her power provoked considerable fear, often presenting, preventing her victims from seeking justice in the first place. Joe Ray was one of the most notorious women of color involved in New Orleans prostitution from roughly 1865 to the mid 1870s. Ray was born in 1842 in or near Louisville, Kentucky. It is very likely that she was born into slavery. By 1870, Ray was a widow running a brothel on Gasquet Street that doubled as a home for her 11-year-old daughter and infant son. By 1873, Ray was located on the same block of Basin as Townsend, and by the end of that year, she was next door to her. Ray's ability to become a Basin Street madam hinged on her access to economic power, as well as the fact that she was considered mulatto and not Negro or Black. Ray's experience was far from typical in that women of color seeking economic gains through prostitution could only do so as madams of brothels with white prostitutes. Significantly, both of the two known women to do so in postbellum New Orleans were mulatto. There was, there was no avenue for black women to pursue economic power as prostitutes. As a madam of color running a brothel with white prostitutes, Ray achieved a moderate degree of economic power as indicated by her brief time as a property owner, avoiding extra time behind bars by paying her bonds and hiring decent lawyers when necessary. Although she reaped some benefits from her financial stability, Ray was still a woman of color who severely tested the limits of how much criminal activity she could get away with. In total, Ray appeared in the first district court and superior criminal court a half a dozen times for crime, crimes ranging from embezzlement receiving stolen property, larceny, and assault and battery. Only once Ray served significant time in the parish prison. Joe Ray may have had, at times, access to an economic power. However, unlike white madams like Kate Townsend, who are on friendly terms with the police, it appears that Ray's status as a woman of color was what landed her in the first district court for the crimes she committed. Whether or not she spent time behind bars is another story entirely. In fact, despite multiple newspaper accounts of Ray's use of violence upon others, only once she faced assault and battery charges in the first district court. The police frequently arrested Ray for a variety of her offenses. However, the recorder's court dealt with most of these minor cases, allowing her to avoid significant punishment. One such example occurred when Ray was in police custody for an assault and battery upon Belle Lee, a young white prostitute who worked for her. According to the New Orleans Republican, Ray violently attacked Lee, who was completely under her control. For reasons unknown, Lee was already in custody when the police arrested Ray. Apparently, while Ray was in jail, she grew so angry that she maltreated little Belle Lee in the cell with her. Even though the second attack upon Lee, while the women were behind, were behind bars and in front of witnesses, Ray did not face charges for either assault. Instead, the judge of the recorder's court released her without any further punishment. Joe Ray severely tested the limits of what she could get away with and lost badly when facing charges for an assault and battery upon a nine-year-old girl. In 1871, Ray and another woman named Maggie Hanley grossly abused Marianne Fields, a young girl in Hanley's care, 
while her mother was serving a sentence in the parish prison. According to several reports, Ray and Hanley forced the girl to drink liquor until she was stupefied. According to Fields, Ray first hit her with a slipper. Then Ray grabbed her by the throat and Hanley threatened her life if she did not drink more liquor. Next, Ray lifted her clothes and instructed the girl to perform oral sex on her. Fields refused and Ray beat her again with a slipper and forced her to drink more alcohol. When the first district court tried Ray, the jury found her guilty. The judge sent her, sentenced her to a year in the parish prison, plus an additional fine of $1,000. In default of the fine, Ray would have to serve an additional year behind bars. It appeared that she did not have the resources to pay such a steep penalty, however, after serving roughly a year of her sentence, despite some initial setbacks, Ray eventually received a pardon from Governor William Pitt Kellogg. That pardon was the second time in her criminal career that she received a reprieve from a Louisiana governor. Despite the fact that both Lee and Fields were less powerful than Ray, the nature and circumstances of her crimes mattered regarding what Ray could get away with. The police were willing to look the other way when Ray acted violently towards a white prostitute who worked for her. When it came to her sexual intentions with a young girl, however, Ray went beyond breaking the law by violating a moral code of demanding a sex act from a child. The fact that this episode occurred between her and a child of the same sex complicated her case even further and resulted in a harsh punishment. In the end, however, what little social power Ray possessed paid off when she secured the pardon after serving approximately half of her sentence. Josephine Taylor was a black woman engaged in New Orleans prostitution from roughly 1866 to 1877, 1887, excuse me. Taylor was born in the South between 1840 and 1845. It is also quite possible that she was born into slavery. Taylor went by a variety of aliases over the course of her career. Several times she went by Sarah Gordon or Sarah Taylor. Once the Daily Picayune referred to her as California Brown, however, most frequently, she was referred to as the Mexican Tigress. Taylor's inability to work in high-class brothels, as well as the frequency of her arrest, barred her from accumulating economic power. As a result, she spent even more time behind bars because of her inability to bond out. Her lack of resources to hire adequate legal representation exacerbated her situation. Over the course of more than two decades, the various criminal courts prosecuted Taylor for violent crimes more than any other woman, between the first district court, the superior criminal court, and the criminal district court, she appeared at least 22 times. Of those 22 cases, Taylor stood accused of violent crimes in at least 18 of them. In all the cases, only three times the court dropped the charges and twice a jury found her not guilty. In total, Taylor spent an incredible amount of time incarcerated as her various prison sentence, sentences amounted to nearly six to possibly eight years behind bars. And the final case known to exist for Taylor was for a robbery, and her sentence was two years imprisonment in the state penitentiary in Baton Rouge. None of this time she spent incarcerated includes the additional time she spent behind bars waiting for her trial to begin, run its course, and conclude as she only had the resources to secure a release on bail once. The greatest obstacle Taylor faced in her attempts to wield power over others through the use of violence was her relationship with the police. Taylor was generally considered by the police force as the most dangerous woman in the city, hesitating at nothing rather than to go to jail. In fact, seven of the 18 violent criminal cases charging, charged her directly with inflicting violence or threatening violence upon police officers. Her use of violence toward the police reflect two things. Two things, a strong desire to take control of her situation and avoid arrest, as well as acting out of retaliation for her arrest, which negated any power or autonomy over herself. Unfortunately for Taylor, her tendency to resist arrest and wield violence over police officers typically resulted in more trouble and jail time. On one such occasion, an officer Cooper went after Taylor when she was chasing a man down the street with a knife in her hand. Upon attempting to arrest her, Taylor turned on him with her knife threatening and cursing at him. According to Cooper, his response to her threat was that he went into a grocery store to look and took an ax handle and threatened her with it. The accused cursed me and it was all I could do to arrest the accused. Despite the fact that this was one of the only cases where Taylor, Taylor merely threatened a police officer, she still received a one year sentence in the parish prison. An example of Taylor using violence towards police as retaliation 
occurred in December 1882, while she was in the second recorder's court dealing with unknown charges. At this point, court was in session, and when an officer Ryan made his way to the judge's bench from the witness stand, Taylor attacked him. According to Ryan, she made a rush at me, caught me by the collar, kicked me twice, once in the stomach and once in the side, and attempted several times to catch me by the privates. It took several officers to get Taylor away from him and restrain her, most likely because she committed this offense in front of several police officers and the recorder's court judge. She pled guilty and was sentenced to three months in the parish prison. Without the economic and social power afforded to white and other white mulatto women engaged in prostitution, Taylor often resorted to violence against those who held power over her. Frequently, she resorted to violence against the police when they attempted to arrest her for acts of violence upon others. In other cases, Taylor's physical aggression came after the police had, their, had her in their custody. These demonstrations of retaliation highlight her efforts to regain power over her situation, even if just for a moment. Surely Taylor understood that inflicting violence upon the police would end badly for her already less than agreeable situation, but she chose to do so anyway. Taylor's reputation among the police as the most dangerous woman in the city was incredibly accurate. Unfortunately for Taylor, the circumstances she often found herself where she presented herself as dangerous did not necessarily translate as powerful. Overall, women's use of violence as a means to assert power and dominance over others was an integral aspect of prostitution in postbellum New Orleans. How well served these women were by acting violently, however, largely depended on their access to economic and social power. For wealthy, well-connected women like Kate Townsend, wielding violence towards others typically resulted in a successful assertion of power that went unpunished. For Joe Ray, who occupied a sort of middle ground, her situation depended on the victim as well as the nature of the crime. For Josephine Taylor, her status as a poor black prostitute denied her the ability to accumulate the economic and social power needed to escape punishment for her violent actions. In the end, the potential penalty for their crimes did not seem to influence any of these women in their decision whether or not to perpetrate acts of violence upon others. As it appears, they did so without hesitation or regret. In an era that aimed to keep women powerless, violence provided a potential avenue of power that many types of women engaged in the business of prostitution were quick to pursue regardless of the consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so we have now heard from the educators and the prostitutes, uh, and we are going to move on to the convicts as part of this session. Uh, our next presenter is Marianne Fisher Giordano, uh, who's going to be presenting a paper entitled, Who and Where Were the Women? The Louisiana Convict Lease, 1868 to 1901. Um, Fisher Giordano is a professor emerita at Grambling State University and has served as the project director for the Angola State Penitentiary Museum Receiving Center Project, Research Center, Exhibits, Archives, Multimedia Room, and Cafe. Uh, she's published um, pieces in 64 parishes, uh, the Angolite, and a variety of academic journals focused on criminal justice, correctional facilities, and race and gender issues of incarcerated individuals. Um, please join me in welcoming Marianne Fisher Giorlodano. You make sure you um, turn on your volume. So the mute button down at the bottom. Yep. There we okay. go. All right. Oh dear. And where did my hmm. my oh share? Here we go. There we are. No. Huh. The PowerPoint is gone. Why is it gone? Oh dear. <laughs> I know where I'm gonna. No, it's gone. I think I'm going to, I guess I'll talk without it. Oh, darn. I had it all set up all day, huh? <sighs> it's. No, I think we don't have enough time and I'll just go ahead without it, okay? I can't be playing to find it now, can I, huh? Okay. Uh. Let me get back. Stop the share. There we go. I'll just talk without it. Um, yeah, I played all day with it, primed up to go. 
Okay, who and where were the women? Louisiana convict lease, 1868 to 1900, actually. Who would you choose for your newborn daughter's nurse, a thief or a murderer? According to Cecile James Shillstone, her father, Samuel L. James Jr., chose the murderer to care for her younger sister, Emma Dorothy James, when she was born in February 1896. Her grandfather, Samuel L. James Sr., is, of course, synonymous with Louisiana's convict lease system, contracting with the state to brutally extract for labor from incarcerated people from 1870 until government officials resumed control in 1901. He it was he who in 1880 purchased Angola along with the Angola plantation along with other properties on which the infamous Angola prison now stands. Papa always chose the murderers in preference to thieves to act as servants, Shellstone remembered. A thief is a sneak and not to be trusted in one's house. Once a thief, he's apt to steal again. Whereas the murderer is hot-headed, committed a crime which he is usually sorry for later and will not do so again. Though Shillstone uses a, a male pronoun in reference to thieves and murderers, her sister's nurse was a woman, one among the many forgotten women in the penitentiary over time. And I have to add a phrase from years ago about the women prisoners, much and unfortunately neglected, okay? Who were the women at the penitentiary? And we got a glimpse of one of them who went to the penitentiary in the previous presentation, didn't we, huh? 1866, the state decides to send the prisoners back to the uh, penitentiary in downtown Baton Rouge, which had been the penitentiary since 1835. Prisoners had been temporarily housed at the end of the war in the parish prison in New Orleans. February 1866, they decide to go back to the penitentiary in Baton Rouge, however. That first year in 1866, 365 prisoners entered the penitentiary, 19 of whom were women. The first woman who entered the penitentiary on February 20th, 1866, her name was Mary, register number 53. The first woman to enter, 40 years old, she died at um, she was sentenced to, for murder and sentenced to a life, prison, life in prison. However, her sentence came to, to a short end because she died less than six months after she entered the penitentiary on August 17, 1866. The um, prison physician recorded 10 other people that died of that same date of cholera, so we can assume that Mary died of cholera. Who were the rest of the women there with her? The majority of them were there on, um, on charges of larceny, uh, two of them only for acts of violence. Uh, Carolyn Humphreys was charged with assault and battery uh, doing four months. The other woman who was charged with a violent offense was interesting. She was convicted of manslaughter and confessed to knifing and killing her husband because he did not act right. Therefore, she would see his heart's blood. Um, the jury took pity on her, though, and decided it'd be man it was an act of passion and only sentenced her to two years. Now, where did the women come from? Unlike before the Civil War, and most of them were immigrants or enslaved women, after the Civil War, we have few immigrants because, in fact, the majority of the women who came to the penitentiary were Black women and we can count under 30 women of 600 that ever entered the penitentiary from 1866 to 1900. Imagine that, huh? Uh, not surprising. Uh, what parishes did they come from? Not surprising again, half of them from New Orleans, the others from the rural parishes. Uh, the only surprise there is that Caddo Parish doesn't show up in that first uh, group of women who enter the penitentiary, which is a, a large, contributor to this day in the penitentiary system, right? Um, so I've already told you the 600 get there. Over all those years, um, 25 only women were convicted of murder. Only two of them were white uh, and 51 were convicted of manslaughter. Now, and boy, I wish I had the picture of the penitentiary, darn. 
uh, where were they? Uh, in the walls uh, is what the penitentiary was called because it was a traditional prison like the northern prisons. And uh, they decided they would repair it. It had experienced a great deal of damage because of the battles that took place. One of the battles took place literally in the yard of the penitentiary during the war. And they decided then to move the prisoners because a musket fell in the yard. So we go back, what's left of the women's prison? The only thing that's left of the women's prison are the walls and the roof, right? Um, the building is 70 feet long by 30 feet wide, three stories high, nothing remaining but the walls and the roof. The plank fencing that had surrounded the bottom floor where the washroom was, where the women did the wash, had been erected there to protect the men from watching the women so they would be per more productive, not to protect the women who, from the men in the penitentiary. Uh, what were they doing while they were there? The wash house on the bottom floor, clearly domestic chores. The first penitentiary report, in fact, says they're washing, ironing, and doing the, and doing the sewing. Um, what's the state of the walls as before we get to Angola? And clearly, we're not at Angola yet. We don't get to Angola until 1880. So where are the women during this period of time, and what are they doing? Um, unlike Unlike what James did with the men where he purposely subcontracted them out all over the state, and it's almost minute by minute, you can't keep track of where they are in, a, in, in terms of the state, in terms of whether they're working on the levees, they're working on the railroads, and they're also, of course, reconstructing the roads, and they had a number of road camps reconstructing after the war. The women, there doesn't seem to be any purpose to what they did with them or where they sent them. Uh, the, the building continues to be in great disrepair. When, they, when the, uh, any investigators come to the penitentiary, there's a famous um, Senate and, uh, you know, a, a co-chaired penitentiary legislators visit the penitentiary they find there are no prisoners there. Where are they? Huh? And they're all over the state because James is making money subcontracting them all. They don't even mention whether there are any women there or not at that point. And there, there's just even little interest for the, for the women that are incarcerated. In 73, a state report happens to mention there's only one woman there. By 74, both a newspaper reporter, the Daily Picayune, and the, uh, the, the investigative uh, committee from the legislature both observed that the women, they're up in Caddo Parish picking cotton. The newspaper reporter is aghast at the fact that these women should be five to 600 miles from home. Why are they out there? The legislators come in, well, they're upset about it also, but they're not upset because they're so far from home. They're questioning whether they should even work outside the walls at all, which was the continuing question about any of the work that was done outside the walls during the lease period by the men too. So not a concern for the women, but should we legally be allowing people to work outside the walls? Well, the next report, lo and behold, 27 more of them show up at the penitentiary because they, they obviously brought them back from Caddo Parish. Um, one, more, one more time, there's evidence that they are outside the walls. They're working in, um, in Point Coupe or in Livonia. Um, there are women picking cotton over there for a short period of time. And the final place we find them in is West Baton Rouge. There's a list on the 1880 census of um, seven women who, two of which only have last names. I can identify them as being in the penitentiary. The others only have first names, but they're all listed as convict laborers. Okay. Now, and I'm doing this fast because as Mark was appalled, <laughs> there were many too many pages to this report. Um, Angola, 
James finally purchases property in West Feliciana. He buys almost 10,000 acres, multiple plantations, one of, itch, one of which is Angola. Now, he purposely subcontracted, subcontracted out the male prisoners to make as much money as he could, bury the money. They're, the state is sure they never got their due or share of that lease contract from him all over, over all those years. I do not believe that was the purpose in bringing the women, the women he brought to Angola, because let me describe the house to you. When they, the Jameses moved into the big house at Angola, they needed a lot of servants. It was a large house with many people living there. At the time of James's death in 1894, the big house contained nine bedrooms, halls upstairs and downstairs, a kitchen, a dining room, front side back galleries, and two servants' houses in the yard. Okay. There was also another house where James Jr. lived at the time with his family. So they're there, the, the women are there at Angola now. There are 19 of them I was able to identify the first year that they occupied Angola in, in 1881. Um, but they also, on occasion, we're going to find them leaving Angola, but they're leaving Angola for a variety of reasons, and it doesn't seem to be the purpose of making money for, for um, James. Twice, they had to evacuate Angola because it was flooded, 1892, 1898, I believe it was. But at one point, James is, um, he's writing a letter to his overseer at another plantation that he owns. And this is what he says to the overseer, Blanche. I have a woman here, a new and excellent cook, having a year to go. I wish to exchange for the long-term woman you have. Please send her down on the leathers with one of the boys, and he can take back the woman which I'm satisfied will serve you better as a house servant, as she is used to that kind of work. And I can use a field hand as the one you have is a good field hand. So this indicates to us they're not only working as servants, they're also working at field hands as, as needed. And I'm going to skip to the interesting part because I think my time is running out. What do I have? Okay. Um, Cecile remembers that they, were, they treated the house servants very kindly because they were trustees and had to be handled with diplomacy. When a servant was not competent, she was not scolded, only another was sent from camp to fill her place the next day. But is that the real story? We have one story from one of the prisoners that she told to a reporter right after she was released from Angola, spending a year there, 86 to 87. She immediately got arrested in New Orleans, was jailed in the parish prison and tried to commit suicide. What was it about Angola? It was not sweetnesses and light as the James's granddaughter has been telling us, obviously. This is the only story we have that I have uncovered to, to this date that gives us some of the words of the women who were incarcerated there. What does Carrie Johnson tell us? Carrie Johnson tells us that soon after she got there, they removed the men to go work on a railroad on a railroad contract to make money and left the women to run the farm. The women obviously then had to do all the work that was designated to the men and it was pretty hard work. But what was most important that Carrie saw, she saw four women die. She saw one woman, Kitty McCoy, beaten to death. Kitty McCoy had left New Orleans in good shape. She was a healthy woman. Um, the, the women seemed to pick up something like blood poisoning that made their limbs weak. They could barely move. And yet the, the captain of that camp whipped them out to the fields to go to work again. So clearly this is a group of women not working in the big house. They're out in the fields. The leather strap had holes in it so that it was even more brutal and left more scars. 
Um, Kitty McCoy is really sick. She's already been in the hospital. She can hardly walk. They make her stand up. The captain tells other women to hold her by the arm, to drag her out to the field, and he whips her, according to Carrie Johnson, at least 100 times on her way out to the field. They drag her back because she fall, she falls down. She can't do anything. And so they bring her back to the quarters and she doesn't move. The captain says she's not really sick, throws a bucket of water on her. She still doesn't move. The next day they find her dead. Carrie Johnson says, and we buried her, if you can call it that. We buried her in a hole. But nobody mourned her. After all, she was only a convict. She was only a Negro convict. That's, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> all right. Well, um, thank you. That was, that was quite a story to listen to. Um, so uh, we are going to move on from the convicts to the mules. Um, so our very last paper today uh, is by Charlotte Jones. Uh, it's Bring Forth the uh, Fiery Untamed Steeds, Lost Horse and Mule Market Districts of New Orleans. Uh, Charlotte Jones is a history practitioner and tour operator. She moved to New Orleans in 2007 to attend the University of New Orleans, where she received her degree in urban and regional planning studies. In 2016, she began working as a carriage driver in the French Quarter, a job that brings her love for animals, humor, and historical cityscapes. Charlotte is currently pursuing her master's degree at Tulane University and won this year's Hugh F. Rankin Graduate Prize in Louisiana History for another paper entitled Conveyors of Creolization, Animal Husbandry Practices in Louisiana, 1716 to 1822. An abridged article of her paper today, Bring Forth the, the Fiery Untamed Steeds, that we're going to hear in just a second, appeared in Country Roads Magazine in August. And I want to mention, uh, Charlotte, I was looking for uh, info on you before you sent me your bio, and an article popped up uh, with an interview done by you um, talking about the state of tourism, particularly uh, carriage mm -hmm. tourism mm -hmm. in New Orleans because of COVID. Yes, uh, so I'm actually I, I look pandemic <laughs> unemployed right now, but you know. <laughs> Yeah. So. Well, we're all really looking forward to hearing your paper. I'm going to turn it over to you. So please welcome uh, Charlotte Jones. Uh, and Marianne, if you can make sure that your uh, volume is turned off so that we can hear Charlotte co completely and all on you. Cool. And I do apologize for the mouthful title. Uh, someone pointed out that mules aren't steeds. It's actually a quote from the Times-Picayune uh, in 1876. So we can blame them for that. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen real quick and we'll get started. go all right y'all can see that okay good all right bring forth the fiery untamed steeds lost horse and mule market districts of new orleans countless photos of bygone days flaunt men in hats and women pulling up hymns to dodge gutter filth as coaches and wagons clog the streets of new orleans for every dozen or so pedestrian pedestrians there's an equine Mules, the long-eared horse-donkey hybrid, work the dirty jobs, pulling massive wagons, towing boats along canals, and lugging large cypress logs out of the swamp. <clears throat> Despite stereotypes that the mules were dumb and stubborn, they dominated southern roads, farms, and urban streets as the preferred draft animal over horses or oxen. Farmers and merchants alike concluded without proof that humble mules could outmuscle a horse and tolerate the Louisiana heat better. Eclipsing horses in Louisiana, the mule became a blue collar beast of the state's cotton and sugar industries and a silent side player in New Orleans as it conveyed trade between global markets and the Mississippi River Valley. <clears throat> Though plenty of New Orleanians owned their horse or mule and stabled it at or near their home, many more equines were company owned, kept in large purpose built stables, and rented out. To supply the incessant demand for cheap draft labor, entrepreneurs opened large barns and liveries in the city. Early newspaper advertisements shine light on these retail horse and mule stables. By 1822, several retail stables dotted Chapatulas near Delord and Julia Streets. That same year, the Circus Street livery stables operated on today's South Rampart and Common Street in what was then the Fabois St. Mary, today's Central Business District. Two blocks down, the Eclipse, Stables boasted advertisements like, 
just arrived from Kentucky, a choice lot consisting of 140 mules selected for the Southern market. In subsequent decades, competitors would also set up shop in this conveniently centralized vicinity, forming something of a cluster by 1860, when it extended to Gravier Street with W.K. Spearing stables. Around the corner, Maxwell and Leonard stable on Barone became the largest advertised equine dealer in Louisiana. The antebellum era stables were practically co-located with the uptown slave depots of the Football St. Mary. On Gravier alone, there were 12 such pins for those in bondage as they moved between seller and buyer in the busiest slave trading city in the nation. Planters believed the hybrids could withstand abuse from enslaved laborers as they suggested to one another that they trick an enslaved man by treating him as an actual human being so he would not be made to understand that he is merely a mule and possessing only the instincts of brute creation and none of the refined feeling of the white man. You cannot expect that he will work to the interest of the master nor for himself and as a natural result will stimulate his evil passions and prejudices. Mules ascended in the South after the Civil War, becoming its predominant draft animal for over half a century. Breeders experimented with jack stock and horses to develop mules preferable for purchase and categorize them by side. Cotton mules ranging from 800 to 1,000 pounds likely provided most urban drayage needs. Sugar mules used on planta plantations weighed about 200 pounds more. In town, they pulled stacks of cotton bales and the city streetcars. Draft mules, the largest of the three, towed the heaviest materials like lumber and marble throughout the city. By 1875, the decades-old agglomeration of stables in the heart of New Orleans developed into a bona fide industry known generally as the mule market. As George Englehart observed in 1904, in the greater cities everywhere, concerns akin assembled together. Thus the grocery and provision lines, the import coffee trade, the ironworks, the printing and publishing houses, the mule, the horse and mule markets have each their own special locality somewhere in or about this particular quarter of trade. It centered along the 300 to 500 blocks of Barone Street between Common and Lafayette Streets and dotted the vicinity. How did multiple depots for bulky, smelly quadrupeds end up two blocks behind a major thor commercial thoroughfare like St. Charles Avenue? The main reason appears to be spatial centralization. Equines work citywide, which made the most, uh, which made the most economically convenient base to be in the urban core. The three to 500 blocks of Barone were fairly close to the city's population, population centroid. Most of the busiest wharves and industries resided within two miles of the markets. Where there were people, port activity, and industry, there was demand for mules, be it pulling streetcars, garbage, garbage wagons, cotton floats, or construction bricks. For, table, for stable and livery proprietors, Co-locating by other commercial districts also meant further convenience to potential clients in the urban core. Businesses in the mule market changed names constantly, but the footprint of the stables and business operations remained remarkably constant for decades on Barone. In 1895, national firms like Martin and Thompson and Company stepped into the New Orleans equine retail market. On Dryads, which is now O'Keefe, the Southern Express Company housed equines for transporting small and valuable articles. Two blocks away, the New Orleans Sanitary Excavating Company stabled their mules. These equines truly carried a burden, that of human waste and garbage removed from ditches and vaults to be dumped in the Mississippi River. Retail stables continued their overlapping modes to rent, buy, um, and sell. Back on the 300 block, Maxwell and Leonard split. The former moved across the street, and Spearing's old board housed beasts of the Postal Service. The mule district had something of a distinctive streetscape. Together with the smells and the sounds, you knew you were there. Barns are not the most aesthetically pleasing forms of architecture. Function dominates form. The barns in this district were spacious and large to accommodate the constant movement of equines. These large stables, simply referred to as mule barns, no matter what animal occupied its space, were typically uniform. Individual stalls were necessary, and the barns boasted large bays and center halls for passage and ventilation. The Sanborn fire insurance maps dutifully noted sta stables, even small private ones, because their construction and haste storage were particularly flammable. And as we can see here, X literally marks the spot. Several included large interior courtyards, likely used as buggy yards and corrals. Another common footprint of large liveries included a perpendicular driveway known as a hitch alley, where potential buyers 
could test animals for hardiness, speed, and workability. As for city dwell dwellers and office workers in this otherwise commercialized neighborhood, they knew the mule market for its pungent smells and mucky streets. <laughs> Edward Barton's groundbreaking report following the yellow fever epidemic of 1853 saw correlations between the deadly disease and sanitation, or more so the lack of it. In the Faubourg St. Marie, uh, St. Mary, the proportion of yellow fever cases tallied 121 per 1,000 people. Barton postulated that the causes of this insalubrity, I can't say that word for the life of me, are fairly ascribable to local conditions which are mainly removable. These local conditions included the back swamps, the cemeteries, kitchen offal and backyard filth, sewage canals, and the extensive livery stables in the heart of the city. The streetscape, including the spread of animal manure and the environmental conditions, was another concern of Barton's and the one, uh, one that he points out as the source of the epidemic. Filth accumulates where there are no pavements, as in many parts of the city, uh, where was the greatest mortality last season, he wrote. To Barton, the Foubault St. Mary contained a series of malefactors like the tenement housing on Philippa Street, known as Kerwin's or Irish Row, and the confined and crowded buildings around Poitras Market that the stables flanked. Considering the amount of water needed to hydrate the animals and the composition of their waste, he correctly accused the livery stables of producing fever nests that vitiated the atmosphere of an extensive neighborhood. Who worked with quad the quadrupeds? Given that uh, drayage was an archetypal blue-collar job, men of all backgrounds and races worked in the industry. By 1850, over 2,000 men in Louisiana worked as tradesmen that depended directly on beasts of burden. This includes coachmakers, draymen, farriers, hostlers, wheelwrights, and so on. Nearly 15,000 men worked in sub-industries and other trades that indirectly depended on draft animals such as cotton packers and produce dealers. Uh, together, these industries accounted for 6% of the population, not counting the enslaved, uh, in Louisiana for 1850. If including agricultural-based jobs like overseers and farmers, that number spikes to 11%, but this is also excluding the enslaved. In 1880, 28% of draymen were African Americans and 30% were, were listed as foreign. The horse and mule market also induced lucrative sub-industries and trades. The, wa the wagon builders, carriage vendors, and so forth typically dot dotted the Faubois St. Mary between Barone Street and the cotton wharves along the Mississippi River 10 blocks away during, during the late 19th century peak of the mule market. Carriage repositories and these affiliated industries cited themselves just off Barone, such as the Phelps Park and Company, a repository located on Perdido Street. In 1866, a French immigrant named Joseph Schwartz moved his com manufacturing company near Phelps, and less than a decade later, he erected a factory at 41 to 47 Perdido. Thus grew a, a cluster of wagon manufacturers on Perdido, squarely between the mule markets of Barone. Schwartz frequently ran advertisements, encouraging residents to come to a shop for a first-rate carriage, buggy, jersey, grocery, or express wagon. Carriage repositories in the wagon district also advertised vehicles essential in agricultural industries like lumber wagons or sugarcane carts. And of course, cotton funneled in and out of the city on wagons called cotton floats, which became distinct for their length and lack of walls hauling dense bales of cotton, tobacco ba uh, barrels, and so forth. Though other vehicles like streetcars were electrified in the 1890s, mules worked well into the mid 20th century but the internal combustible engine would forever change transit and agriculture. Simultaneously, another yellow fever outbreak in 1904 prompted the city to take sanitary measures like banning cisterns. It's unsurprising that the presence of smelly, bulky quadrupeds would be viewed as antagonistic to progress in the new century. Barone Street was also going through a transformation as it increasingly became standard modern American downtown commercial district. Banker and real estate mogul Emilian Perrin noticed the potential of Barone and its proximity to major thoroughfares like Canal, Poydras, and St. Charles. He swiftly achieved fame for developing multiple beacons of progress and transforming Barone into a commercial and entertainment thoroughfare. Perrin set his sights on the mule markets, viewing the, uh, the unsightly stables as practically unimproved property. As Perrin aimed to, re to redefine Barone Street, the city legislated a series of measures to push out the meal markets. 
The first ordinance prohibited the driving of mules through public streets unhaltered after a green or untrained mule bolted through Martin Mannion's store on Barone. According to Mannion's son, stable operators on Barone previously agreed to halt driving mules up Canal Street after a green mule ran into D.H. Holmes on Canal Street. He also alleged that a local proprietor confided to him that he would be willing to move his stable from Barone if there was a law compelling all to move. In 1905, the city introduced more ordinances to push the mule market away from the urban core. The Brandau ordinance aimed to prohibit stables on residential streets and move decades long neighborhood stables out altogether. The city debated the ordinance for weeks while simultaneously long established stable owners protested a land use ordinance that would move sales stables out of the business district altogether. But with Perrin's hefty ca uh, cash flow, an equine firm on 500 Barone eagerly sold for a fanciful $100,000 in 1905. That's over 2.8 million today. And the city eagerly anticipated for the other liveries to follow suit. Large firms and the longtime horse baron of Barone Street, William Leonard, then 70 years old, bitterly fought the proposals. One on owner alleged that the city uh, where do you go? Oops. simply wants to dictate to us where we should carry on our business, and this is something we are not going to stand for. What the defenders of the district were up against, of course, was not obstinate officials or bad legislation, but a changing world that would eventually render their industry nearly obsolete. Yet the mule markets managed to remain on Barone for the next two years. Proprietors on Barone finally found a compromise in 1906 when several firms partnered with the New Orleans Terminal Company. The rail company established a horse and mule market behind the stockyards in Araby, in addition to a new series of barns at the intersection of Bienville and Carrollton. Uh, the new structures were patterned after the great stables in Kansas City, but many improvements were devised. The result is that while they are not as, as extensive as those in Kansas City, the stables are the finest in the world. Not as extensive, but still impressive, three of the large barns could quarter up to 1,500 mules. Time Memorial Barone Street has been the center of the mule tra trade. One writer waxed upon the pending decline of the district and the trade. Barone Street became a new beacon of progress, boasting car dealerships and the budding electrical industry in the city. The city directory only lists five carriage repositories for that year. Many of them former Wagoners, including Schwartz's company, made a natural transition from the carriage to the auto car. By 1915, only 15 stables remained in the city, none of which were on Barone. With origins in the 1820s and a peak in the late 1800s, Mule markets help supply Louisiana with patient and, plot, and patient and obstinate animals plodding through the streets, conveying heavy loads from place to place and assisting in the commercial progress of the city. Though the beasts of burden were viewed as simple machines most of the time, they maintained a social omnipresence across racial and economic lines. In recent scholarship, the mules economic and ge geographic contributions in urban environments have been severely overlooked. Relics of the wagon district and mule markets are sparse today. Former carriage repositories still stand throughout the central business district. Typically, the locations of former stables are now parking lots or the foundations for high rises. The hitch alley of the long demolished Southern Express Company between O'Keefe and, and South Rampart is now the extension of Union Street. The street widens and acutely angles along the same footprint. Only one coincidental connection to the mule market remains on the 500 block of Barone Street, thanks to the location of a New Orleans chain restaurant. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Charlotte Jones. That was fascinating. Um, so we've got a question in the chat feed um, that maybe James Wilson can provide a link to the YouTube channel uh, where we could find uh, the slides and the presentation again. Um, a lot of people enjoyed looking at them. Uh, so knowing that you can't see that while you're presenting, I thought I would tell you now. Um, I'm pleased to uh, present our, um, our commentator today, uh, Mark Fernandez who is the Patricia Carlin O'Keefe Distinguished Professor of History and Chair of the Department of History at Loyola University, New Orleans. As a former president of the Louisiana Historical Association, he's going to be leading the commentary today for this session. And at this point, I fully turn it over to him. Uh, thank you all. 
Thanks, Liz. Um, I was, I've been thinking throughout this whole session that I can't wait to read Liz's book on the 2020 hurricane season when she turns her attention to that one. Uh, what, a, what a year. Uh, and, and what a great thing about being on Zoom. Uh, probably the best thing about being on Zoom for a meeting like this is your wife can hand you a gin and tonic just before you make your uh, commentary, which normally doesn't happen at the LHA except for the famous Judy Schaefer Memorial Panel where we sip martinis the whole time. And Howard Hunter and Justin Nystrom served us. Um, I always try to find a common theme in sessions like this to pull the papers all together, but uh, thinking about educators, nuns, prostitutes, convicts, and mules uh, is quite a challenge. Thanks, dear pal Bill Robison, for uh, putting me on as commentator to this panel. I really appreciate it. I'll get you back one of these days. As I was thinking about the papers, I thought maybe I should uh, write the President Trump's new commission on history. Maybe those experts could give me some tips about how to uh, comment on papers uh, that are that are so wide ranging, but also so um, important. Uh, obviously, the common themes uh, that weave through these papers, while not through every one, uh, have a lot to do with women in, and institutions. Uh, and each of these fine papers uh, sheds important light on aspects of Louisiana history, uh, and particularly the history uh, uh, of women and, and institutions, and offer new perspectives. Uh, that enrich our already impressive Louisiana historiography. I remember Carolyn DeLatte's uh, presidential uh, address many years ago, uh, late Carolyn DeLatte, we miss her so much. Um, and one of the things she talked about uh, was the need for um, a more uh, substantial urban history of New Orleans. I think Lindsay Silver and Charlie Jones uh, really add to that, that need. And I wanna thank them for exploring uh, those comments. I'm going to be brief because I'm sure there will be questions. I already see a couple of numbers in the chat that I, I uh, so that I'm thinking they're questions. I'm not going to take time and open the chat. And so I'm going to go through the papers one on one uh, briefly with just a few observations. Uh, and uh, hopefully I'll be brief enough that we'll have time uh, for some Q&A. Uh, Petra Henry's fascinating exploration of the role of Catholic women educators really expands our horizons in important ways. Uh, what I really like best about Petra's paper it, it is the scope of her analysis of these, these nuns and educators and, and their role in education. Uh, beginning with a French religious order, sending an Irish nun uh, to New Orleans and then ultimately to Galveston, uh, you know, I really think sets this up not only in a broad Atlantic world context, which you know, certainly a lot of our, our colonial historians, early national historians have been doing over the years, but this is the first time I'm really seeing it relating to education uh, in this way. And it also integrates um, this Atlantic world into the world of the back countries and borderlands uh, of, of 19th century America. And I think that's really important way to begin a study. Often in Louisiana history, and rightly so in many cases, we study our history in a bubble, it's very localized, it's dealing with just a, a town, New Orleans, or the state. Um, you know, we, there are exceptions to this, of course, but I, I think what, what Petra's doing here is bringing the kind of scope and analysis to the study of, of nuns and educators that we see in works, I, I think I saw Dan Usner, yeah, Dan Usner's here, uh, that we see in works like Dan Usner's classic um, Indian Settlers and Slaves in the Frontier Exchange Economy. And I'm really glad Petra's taking that approach uh, with her research. And then her examples uh, are, are so diverse and multiracial, multicultural, even Protestants are being educated by these Catholic nuns. Uh, and, and I think that's a story that, that, that gets, get, gets washed over in so many ways in terms of the inclusiveness and diversity of these back countries and borderlands, especially of all of early America and all the early American Republic, but in these areas especially where the lines are so fluid and people are able to cross through them. So in terms of, uh, you know, I think of Sarah Sunderland's work on, on intermarriage in the, in the Texas borderlands uh, and the legal arrangements there, the religious arrangements there that the church handled, and now we're seeing uh, you know, Petra pulled the veil back on these uh, women educators and religious 
uh, who are interacting uh, with uh, so many diverse people and really providing alternate models and challenging our notions of, you know, the, 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 the origins of, of, of education, much of it public, even though it's coming uh, from this Catholic place. I, I think that's a very important contribution to our historiography, and, and I really want to commend uh, Petra for doing this. We've spoken a little bit about her work over the years, but never this aspect of it. And I'm kind of blown away uh, by it. And I'm very excited uh, to read about it. I, I absolutely believe, uh, and, and in fact, when you think about the people who are being served, the fluidity of these schools and institutions, the, the diversity of uh, the, the teachers and the students, um, different languages, different backgrounds, uh, um, coming from all over, representing parts of the Atlantic world, Ireland, France, the Canary Islands, uh, you know, or, or coming through um, uh, uh, families coming from the Canary Islands. Uh, it, it's really um, very exciting. And I think, you know, maybe today when we're all so concerned about diversity and inclusion in higher education, uh, it's nice to know that there was a time where this was actually going on. And then, uh, at least uh, in, in many places, Jim Crow kind of put an end to all of that, as did uh, increasing population settlement and, and uh, white control. And, and, and I think that's important. And I hope, I, I think we're starting to see uh, scholars of, of segregation, for example, uh, beginning to discuss aspects of Jim Crow outside of the South. Uh, and, and it really is, you know, it's something that's happening all across America and New England and the Midwest, uh, in the far West, uh, especially. Um, and I like, I like the fact that, that, that Petra is giving us a great example of perhaps what education could have been uh, before these other things uh, got involved and uh, made it more monochromatic, uh, more uh, uh, white and, and, and less diverse. So uh, I think there's some really good stuff uh, happening uh, here. Sarah Sundberg, I'm sorry, I said Sarah, I believe I misspoke and said Sarah Sunderland. Um, I agree with Petra's um, uh, notion that weaving the stories of these marginalized educators into the fabric of, Mer of American history is long overdue. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Uh, I also agree with her broad conclusions about Americanization and Creolization, but I like the fact that she takes these terms, particularly Americanization, uh, which was used in a very homogenous way for much of the 20th and early 21st century, and she brings the kind of subtle nuances to that question that scholars like Peter Castor and uh, Lowe Faber uh, have done in their books uh, around the Louisiana Purchase uh, period. I, I, I really um, especially admire Faber's uh, discussion of Americanization and, and, and his de sort of expansive definition of that ideology uh, in building the lands of dreams. And, and so uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to see that, you know, Creolization in a sense is Americanization. It's, it's, it's all interweaved and Petra keeps a, a real handle on that difficult uh, aspect of interpretation. Lindsay Silver builds on the foundations of pioneering scholars like Judy Schaefer and Leisha Long uh, in her exploring the lives uh, uh, of, or exploring the institution of prostitution. And I really love the fact that she picks these, these three disparate examples and yet presents them in a way that we see their interrelationships. You know, we see their differences too, but we see um, their interrelationships uh, uh, with the question of violence, which of course is a, a part of the prostitution and sex trade community uh, and always has been. Uh, but we see this from the women's side uh, of this in some really important ways, important ways that mirror some other things about uh, violence and the law uh, in American society, not just in Louisiana society uh, as, as well. Um, I think in Kate Townsend's case, we get a real sense of how success and wealth and power can favor the person that possesses them, even if they are a madam. Uh, and so her ability to just act with almost impunity and, and propagate violence on others and basically get away with it most of the time uh, is a good example. I, you know, I, I have this weird image of her 
uh, in court with um, F. Lee Bailey and Johnny Cochran and the rest of the Dream Team behind her. And that's certainly uh, not something that um, uh, T Ray, Taylor and Ray could, could expect. Uh, but even uh, the, this sort of um, mixture of different aspects of what we might see as the um, race and class aspects within the institution of prostitution uh, is really fascinating. So on the one hand, we have Townsend, who we might see as sort of the elite madam uh, in, in the group, um, and Taylor, uh, you know, being of a different uh, ethnic and racial background and maybe not being as successful, uh, struggling a little bit more, but still being part of, you know, sort of the elite class of, of the side of, prost of, of prostitution uh, and being able to get uh, away with that. And then the heartbreaking stories of, of uh, the Mexican tigress of, of uh, uh, California Brown, as she's called. Boy, what an interesting thing to find uh, in the newspaper records. Uh, I think it tells us a lot about how New Orleanians at the time uh, are, are looking at these conceptions. And then, you know, while, yeah, okay, she's, uh, she, she's a tough character and the police see her as a major threat. Um, and she is, is, is interacting with the law in very different ways than the other two examples uh, it, it is really important. Um, but her ca casual attitudes toward violence, her, her, her uh, repeated violent attacks, sometimes, you know, obviously in, when you're incarcerated, you may resort to violence for very specific reasons because you have to. Uh, but I, I think it shows the, the, the unfortunate trickle-down effects uh, of this um, institution on the people involved in it. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I really uh, like the contribution uh, she's making here. It gives us a much more nuanced understanding of that world of prostitution. And it gives us a sense that not only were women in the institution often vic uh, usually victimized, uh, but they could become perpetrators uh, as well. And their role as perpetrators can change depending on their status uh, within that institution. Great work, Lindsay. I, I really think it's, it's a fine paper. Uh, I was teasing Marianne yesterday uh, or the day before um, uh, about her long presentation, although she was admirably uh, in sync with the Taylor rules uh, today, but she sent me a 28 page paper. Uh, and, uh, I have to admit, I didn't get to examine it quite as carefully as the others because I, I, I got it Tuesday afternoon. Um, but what is it? This is classic Marianne Fisher G. Orlando scholarship. She has taken uh, really thorny questions uh, related to the penal system, got the shovel out, dug through the materials, and has given us example after example of uh, the people involved in, in the women involved in the convict police system, which again is um, a real eye-opening uh, bit of information, not only just in the sheer numbers uh, uh, of them and the identification of them, which is all very important, but the, 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 the conditions they lived in um, inside and outside the walls, uh, they the uh, holding them at Angola, you know, is, is, is interesting. I'd love to know more about the conditions in their living conditions uh, at Angola, but I know it's just dicey. Yeah, I, I, you know, I had a thesis student working in some of those records a couple of years ago, and, and it, it is what it is. You get what you can out of it, uh, but it, it's painstaking research, and I think we, we're all used to seeing that from Marianne. Um, the one thing, I think she touches on that's vitally important. She does a little bit more in her conclusion in the paper, which was a little different than the conclusion in the presentation today, is the, this, um, the reminiscences of Cecile Shillstone uh, and Carrie Robinson. Uh, those those are, are, are really fascinating in their disparity. I, I think it's probably easy for most of us to see which one is, has the more accurate memory, uh, and it's the incarcerated woman, uh, and not, not the, the child that she nursed. Um, but I think there's, there's, a, there, there's a real 
connection there between these two women and other women like them uh, in this uh, in the period uh, where Carrie Robertson was at Angle uh, was part of the convict lease system. I think there are parallels between Cecile Shillstone uh, and um, the um, uh, other women in Southern, other elite women in Southern society who at the time she was being nursed uh, were erecting monuments to a lost cause and contributing to a history of the antebellum period that none of us that have ever dug into any of the records of the antebellum period recognize as true. And unfortunately, those, those stories are still very much a part of the way Americans look at that period today. Bad for us. I seriously doubt the Presidential Commission is going to change that. Uh, and, and in fact, I, 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 I think I more than seriously doubt that. Um, and so I, I think that's a, a time uh, that I'd like to see some more comparison uh, to, just as I would, and I know this is not uh, something I, that I think the extant record will support, just as I, now that I know about these people, I'm fascinating about the cultures. Uh, surely we see the difference between field hands and domestic workers. Um, not that we should be surprised at that. The parallels to the treatment uh, in, in, the period, in the antebellum period, I think are pretty interesting here. I mean, it, clearly we're looking at a type of incarceration that, that is embracing slavery and, and you know, getting through the, the loopholes in the 13th Amendment. Uh, so she alludes to this in conclusion, she didn't do it today, but um, I, I, I do believe that none of the actual women who are incarcerated would want to sing along in a Stephen Foster style tune uh, with Cecile Shillstone. Uh, and thanks to Marianne, we're seeing a more clearer picture. I would also like to see maybe breaking out of the Louisiana bubble uh, a little bit on this. I know Marianne has devoted her life to studying Angola, and thank goodness uh, we all benefit from, from that scholarship. But I'd like to see, and I hope this will spur people in other Deep South states, scholars in other Deep South states, to start looking at the convict lease system and incarceration uh, in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia. Maybe they are, I'm not really familiar with the penal. Uh, scholarship of, of the latter part of the 19th century in the way that I'm familiar with other aspects of Southern legal history. Uh, but but I, I do hope that there's a, 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 a synergy that develops with this scholarship and we can see more about that. Charlotte Jones, um, I never learned so much about mules in such a short time in my entire life. And frankly, when I saw the title of your paper, I wasn't sure I wanted to. And then as I started reading this, this, I was every bit enamored of the work as the person who put the note in the chat, please let's see the presentation. And unfortunately, I didn't have the slides either from your presentation or Petra's, so it was really nice seeing them today. I hope, uh, James, when you put this on the YouTube channel, you can add uh, Mary Ann's in the comments so people can see her PowerPoint that we weren't able to see uh, today. I don't know how, po I, I'm not a big YouTube, I have a YouTube channel, I can't even remember the password and how to get into it. And so I, I don't, I don't know um, how that uh, stuff works. But I think you've done an, an excellent job of tracing the early history of how stables play an important part in the emergence of what you call a bona fide industry district. I see, we, we see the CBD developing and then transmorphing into something else. Uh, throughout the scope of that paper, and I think that's a really part, uh, a important um, part of the urban history of New Orleans that that we don't know much about. And I know Carolyn Delat um, would be really excited about this paper. And when I say that, I mean it as a high compliment because uh, if you've ever, if those of you who remember Carolyn Delat's comments on papers at the LHA know that she was a pretty serious critic. And so uh, great work there. Um, I think you do a really nice job of tracing the commercial realities of the area. Uh, notice, especially when you talk about, and this is one thing I'd like to know a lot more about, the, the, that the markets are, are cons uh, consistently changing names. And so you, I think we're seeing businesses open and fail, open and fail, open and fail. I, I could be wrong about that. But I think there's a really important economic aspect to that. I know this is a short LHA paper, 
uh, and you've probably, just judging from the quality of research, I know you've probably researched that and know as much about it as you know about all these other things, and I hope it appears in an expanded form in the journal, uh, as I hope all of these papers will appear in the journal. I don't know if Michael's here, but Michael, um, you know, get to it. We want these, we want these things in print. Um, I, I also like how they transform the space based on the realities. That, that, that's not, you know, uh, a, a unique assumption. It's something I think we all know, but um, tying this into the, to the uh, end game of the market and seeing the partnership between the proprietors of the New Orleans Terminal Company at a time in the early 20th century when transportation is changing uh, is, is a really good connection to make. I'm glad you, you, know, you go back to 1853 and the yellow fever outbreak and, and, and deal with that aspect of the urban life, you know, having these quadrupeds and all of their byproducts in the midst of the city. Of course, we want to get them out of the, the city as canal streets, nearby canal streets becoming more uh, mercantil mercantilized and, and other parts of the city uh, in the CBD are taking place. So I, I love that. Um, and I especially love the digging you did into the ancillary occupations related to the stables. You know, we're not just talking about stables here. We're talking about a big economic engine, a big employer uh, of the city of New Orleans with an extremely diverse number of jobs, it, maybe even more diverse than, than the realities of the frontier missions that, that Petra was talking about. Um, Identifying that, working in the statistics over the enslaved and the free it is very important, but obviously, uh, and, and I don't know if this is possible from the records, but obviously when you just look at the, the variety and the numbers, especially those occupations, which are sometimes boisterous occupations, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about a lot of tough people uh, applying their trade in this area. I have to believe there's an amazing culture there that's waiting to be uncovered. I just don't know if the extant record uh, will reveal that, but I think we have a competent scholar here who can do it and do it in excellent ways. Um, so I, I love the aspect of, of uh, how this adds to our understanding of the city's layout and its commerce uh, and um, and you know, it, it, it's cool to learn something from the mules. Uh, I, I really enjoy that. So just in conclusion, nuns, prostitutes, and uh, convicts, and mules, hmm. uh, what do they have in common? To a really nice extent, these papers do a good job at uh, illuminating the racial complexities and realities of early Louisiana and New Orleans and the wider uh, area that New Orleans is situated in, both in the region and the nation, and the transnational aspect in, in, in uh, uh, Petra's paper, especially. I, I think, um, and, 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 I, and I, 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 I think that um, uh, we've got a great handle on that. I think um, uh, so, um, Silver and uh, Fisher G. Alanda do an equally impressive job focusing in on the consequences of violence uh, in, 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 and, and um, that, that's really exciting uh, as well. Um, I hope that these authors uh, will expand these papers. Mary Ann, yours is at a good spot to begin submitting to Michael. Uh, but I, I look forward to the longer manuscripts from these other folks as I look forward to Petra's book, uh, to Lindsay's dissertation, and to uh, Charlotte's master's thesis. Uh, I, I can't wait to see these things. Um, and again, I, who'd have thought we could have, take such disparate um, occupations and ideas and pull them into such a strong panel. Uh, thank you panelists for, for doing that. And thanks Liz for keeping us all in line. Now, I do think we have time, do we Liz for, we're past our time. No, sadly we are out of okay, time. Um, so, Sorry, I'm trying yeah. to be brief, there's a lot to pull together there. 
I thought you did a wonderful job and a very eloquent summation of all things. Um, and I'm sure that everybody who was on the chat feed and whatnot would agree. Um, you are welcome to contact each of the panelists uh, regarding your questions. Um, and we hope that you join us at the next one of these uh, LHA online presentations uh, on October 8th. The subject of that one is New Orleans's images capturing and illustrating the Crescent City's African American history. Uh, thank you to the panelists, particularly to those presenting today. It was a fascinating discussion um, and I look forward to seeing where this goes. Um, thank you to Mark as well. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and sign off now. Uh, Before so we do, let's, let's face it, we all know what we do at the end of the day after the last panel. So cheers. <laughs> yeah, cheers, cheers to everyone. I don't have a drink, but I will go get one now. Um, so Mark will drink in, instead for all of us. Um, <laughs> but thank you everyone for attending uh, and we'll see you all next time, October 8th.